Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar entitled An Update, Supplementing with the Right Dietary Nutrients. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Tom Williams. My name is Michael Chapman, and I'm Product Development Manager at Genova Diagnostics, and I'm going to serve as the moderator for today's webinar. We would like to welcome Dr. Tom Williams, who earned his doctorate in molecular immunology from the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. For the past two decades, he has spent his time investigating the mechanisms and actions of lifestyle and nutrient-based therapies, and is an expert in the therapeutic uses of dietary supplements. Tom serves as an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin School of Pharmacy and is the VP of Science for Orthomolecular Products. Since 2014, he has been writing a series of teaching manuals or roadmaps that outline and evaluate the evidence for the principles and protocols that are fundamental to the functional and integrative medical community. He's the founder and director of the Point Institute, an independent research and publishing organization that facilitates the distribution of many of his publications. Frequent guest speaker, Dr. Williams provides training to a variety of healthcare disciplines in the use of lifestyle and natural medicines. He lives in the woods outside of beautiful Stevens Point, Wisconsin with his wife and children. I will turn over the controls to Dr. Williams. Thank you, Michael. Um, this is a topic that I have been uh, obviously uh, concerned about or dealing with for, um, I don't know, the last 20 years almost. <clears throat> and so we're gonna, we're gonna go through a lot of information. We're gonna highlight a lot of the issues in the challenge of supplementing with the right dietary nutrient. Uh, obviously there's a lot of marketing jargon around all kinds of different uh, supplement nutrients. Um, I'm not gonna deal so much with food versus supplements, but I will deal with something that is often called whole food supplements later on. So um, the objective is really to help a lot of times with this question about natural versus synthetic vitamins in particular, distinguishing when those differences matter clinically, uh, to try up to clear up some confusion about marketing terms used to promote various vitamins and minerals and perhaps other compounds. And then we're gonna dip our toe into discussing some differences between some fatty acids in fish oil in particular and phytonutrients and some bioavailability issues. So we're gonna kind of cover a, a wide swath of information. Um, and like I said, you know, are we, are we talking about the same sort of thing? So, you know, there's lots of information about food and nutrients and that's where, our nutrients and foods, excuse me. And that's where we get a lot of our epidemiological data, you know, people who eat certain foods and then we try to break them down into what nutrients. So how much vitamin C is in the diet or vitamin D or, you know, magnesium. And then we try to compare that later to a supplement that contains a certain amount of that particular, uh, you know, nutrient, and then we try to compare a, an intervention trial with sort of epidemiology. And so we're going to see, you know, some differences between food nutrients and supplement nutrients um, and why there's some differences uh, either known and some that are uh, relatively unknown. So the basis, the basic premise of nutrient supplementation is, is this idea that we can deliver nutrients outside of their food matrix. Um, and when they're delivered in that way, they're different. And so for, I always consider these outside the natural food matrices, there's advantages and disadvantages depending on you know, what you're trying to do with the nutrient, the food or, or the subject themselves. As you know, some people can't absorb certain nutrients very well from their food. And so that makes a big difference. But most dietary supplement products include additional ingredients. So anytime we're taking nutrients and we're packaging them, even if it's in a, in a functional food or it's in a capsule, obviously, to create a dose control, especially for the FDA, which requires us to have the exact amount of nutrient in there, um, there's gonna be some unnaturalness to it. So the idea that supplementing nutrients in any manner, even fortification in food, is the same as the nutrient in the food, I always deem is somewhat out of nature, although I don't consider that a bad thing necessarily, it's just different. So we need to really understand that nearly all supplementation requires some compromise um, and it's not purely natural. So no matter what somebody tells you, if it's in a capsule, there's something slightly unnatural about that because nutrients in nature don't come from capsules. So if we can kind of clear the deck on that idea, it would be a good place to start. So let me talk a little bit about sort of how I view supplementation just in general. So to get this off the table, I've got a, a series of, of things that I've written um, the first I wrote was a book called The Original Prescription, which gives sort of my view of lifestyle medicine. And I 
created what I called this uh, prevention to intervention hierarchy. And essentially, and, and this is of course is also the, the basis for the book Supplementing Dietary Nutrients, which is being updated right now. Um, and it'll be out, uh, the second edition will be out uh, early next year. But essentially, what do I mean by this, uh, this prevention intervention hierarchy? Well, lifestyle maintenance is essentially that, you know, we have, uh, we can maintain uh, our health just by living. We don't have to think about uh, interventions. We just live life. We eat healthy. We, we are physically active. We've got a good support structure. Anytime we think of lifestyle medicine, we typically are thinking at intervention. This is where we're choosing one diet over another, where we're choosing an exercise plan to be physically active specifically for a certain dose or a certain length of time, or we're kicking certain habits. Um, when we need to augment that lifestyle intervention, that's what we're typically talking about here. When we're talking about supplementing nutrients, we're taking those signals in our diet and other places, for instance, like sulforaphane, some sort of phytochemical or a B vitamin or whatever, and we're specifically inter intervening with an augmentation for that signal. And that's mostly what we're talking about in, in functional medicine as an intervention beyond sort of just basic lifestyle interventions. And then finally, of course, rescue intervention is drugs and surgery. So along the continuum, I always consider lifestyle medicine at the core of all the therapies that we want. I, I certainly wouldn't want to think that supplementing nutrients is in place of eating a good diet, but it clearly can be a place to augment that. So just to orient yourself in, in the way that I'm thinking about this. So let's just dig into this first topic of a uh, question I get, you know, all the time is, you know, are, are these vitamins synthetic or are they natural? And so my first question, and I think we need to ask the question, well, what is the difference and how are we going to define the terms natural and synthetic? And you're going to see that it's not exactly the, the, the simplest question to, to answer. Um, and then the second question, is there evidence to suggest that supplementing with a quote natural vitamin is better or different than supplementing with say a synthetic analog? So let's just kind of start with the, the, the nomenclature or the definitions that I'm going to use here. Um, I consider a natural vitamin or a natural mineral are those which are found unmodified in nature and are delivered in the food itself or maybe by concentrating or isolating a natural source of that nutrient. So if we could take a compound from let's say broccoli, just concentrate it and not modify it at all, um, you know, that's pretty close to natural. Um, and I consider synthetics, in a sense, everything else. Um, and so we'll see that that some synthetics are closer to nature than others. Um, and so when we think of synthetics, most of them are either bioidentical or bioequivalent molecules. So uh, we're going to see that, again, these terms also need to be defined, a bioidentical versus a bioequivalent molecule. Many of these are also derived from naturally sourced ingredients. For instance, I won't mention, you know, I don't think I talk about this, uh, but ascorbic acid is derived from sorbos, which is a corn product. So corn sorbos, which is a sugar, is converted to ascorbic acid. It's naturally derived, but it's not naturally derived as ascorbic acid from, from corn. So the other kind of confusing thing that we have in the middle here is that we have all kinds of foods that are fortified. So we might think of milk as a food, but milk has vitamin D added to it or calcium added, extra calcium added to it. Almost all the cereals that we that we consume that are prepackaged, almost all of them have uh, vitamins and sometimes minerals added back to them. Um, orange juice, oftentimes, uh, of course, iodized sea salt is, is one of the classic cases. And you can see the map here of all the countries that have fortified flour with folate. So the, the world is full of foods that are also supplemented, and most of, these sup, most of these supplemental ingredients in the food are, I think most people would consider them synthetic analogs, like folic acid, uh, rather than a natural folate. And, and we can talk, we'll talk more about the differences there on these things. So this sort of adds a sort of a, a, a question about, is this from food or is this from fortification? So if I ask the question about what is bioidentical, these are synthetic compounds whose molecular, molecular structure is identical to the compound made in humans or consumed in unfortified foods. So for instance, I mean, you, you cannot tell the difference. A, a chemist could not define 
or show a difference between the compound that you said is there like ascorbic acid and a vitamin C or ascorbic acid found in let's say oranges. Um, bioequivalent is a synthetic compound that can be readily converted by the body into a compound with a function that's indistinguishable from the compound made in humans or consumed in foods. So we're, we're gonna talk about some of this and actually the, there's a bioequivalent compounds, let's say for instance, vitamin B6, there's actually three different forms of B6 in nature and we consider them all bioequivalent because the body can interconvert them, but they're not all exactly the same compound um, from a chemistry standpoint. So most of you are familiar with this question about uh, synthetic versus bioidentical hormones. And I just wanna kind of use this as a, as a kind of a, a way to think about this. So progesterone and in this case, um, hydroxyprogesterone acetate, these are two different compounds. Progesterone on the left is the compound made in the body. Um, the compound made on the right is a synthetic analog, which has some of the equivalents, but it's certainly not all of the equivalent of progesterone. So in this case, the synthetic medroxyprogesterone is neither bioidentical nor truly bioequivalent because there's actually some different profiles in them. So when you say, well, I wanna use a bioidentical hormone, I wanna use progesterone itself. So what do you go and do? Well, we can take wild yam, this shows there's actually several different precursors to this, but we can take wild yam, uh, diastgenin from wild yam, which you can see the, the uh, compound here, which is not progesterone, nor is it uh, bioidentical or bioequivalent, but it can be converted in the laboratory or in a, in a uh, factory into a bioidentical compound of progesterone. So we can go through and, you know, all these different, this is called the marker semi-synthesis of progesterone from diastgenin, and we can create from a natural source, a synthetic version of a bioidentical hormone. So now you can see, is this synthetic or is this natural? And you can see already we're getting into the question of, of that. Now, obviously our body does the same thing, except it uses cholesterol through pregnenolone into progesterone. So if it's a synthesis from a precursor molecule and the commercial synth synthesis is simply taking diastgenin and producing the same bioidentical compound. So again, you can ask your question, is this naturally synthesized or synthesized to be natural? But you have sort of the, the end result is, is the same. However, taking progesterone orally in any manner is unnatural, meaning we typically in nature, we're not consuming progesterone uh, through oral means, we're synthesizing it ourselves. So it, in either case, taking it orally is a somewhat unnatural phenomena. So let's talk about vitamin D, vitamin D3 in particular. Um, so here is showing the synthesis of vitamin D normally in your body. Cholesterol is converted to 7-dehydroxy cholesterol, which is what we call pro-vitamin D3. When sunlight hits your skin, if you've got uh, 7 uh dehydroxy cholesterol, it will then convert into the precursors that then lead to vitamin D3 or cholecalciferol. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see that there's actually a molecule called ergosterol, which is a pro-vitamin D2 found in uh, some fungi, mushrooms, and yeast. And also when UV light hits that, um, it converts into vitamin D2 and ergocalciferol. So obviously that both of these compounds um, have somewhat bioequivalency in the body, although they have a slight different uh, bioavailability when taken orally. But, you know, you're, you're giving vitamin D3 to your patients. You're obviously not using uh, ground up skin uh, to give in capsules. So where does vitamin D3 come from? Well, as it turns out, almost all the vitamin D3 that you're using, in fact, I would probably say all of it, actually is derived from sheep wool lanolin. What is in sheep wool lanolin? Well, as it turns out, it's rich with 70 hydroxy cholesterol. And so when sheep wool lanolin is taken and converted with UV light, so UV light has to be used uh, in lanolin, you convert that to vitamin D3, and then you can then purify it and obviously make supplements out of it and whatnot. So this is a semi-synthetic, naturally derived compound um, that allows us to deliver vitamin D3 um, obviously, some people would consider this a, obviously it's a, it's a non-vegetarian source, obviously, but some pure vegans would actually be opposed to taking vitamin D3 and choose instead to take vitamin D2 uh, because it's typically going to be yeast or fungi derived. 
Um, when it comes to the differences between the two, I don't we don't have time to get into the, the subtle differences. They work in the body very similarly, um, vitamin D2 and D3. Um, and But we do know that if you compare almost all the head-to-head -head studies that compare D3 with D2 um, oral bioavailability, almost all of them have favored D3. In some cases, like I show here, just one of the studies in this meta-analysis where you get sometimes an extreme difference between them, uh, you can see that almost all the studies here favor the D3. Sometimes the higher bolus doses, uh, when you're giving things like 50,000 I use once weekly, the vitamin D3 really shines uh, compared to the D2. So once it's in the body and once it's functioning, um, they both really function in a very similar manner um, from a molecular standpoint, but uh, we, we do notice that this, that this difference here. So minerals, I, I, we don't have time to get there. So many minerals and we could talk specifically about the absorption of you know, magnesium citrate versus magnesium oxide, all these kind of things. But I just wanna back up and ask the question, what is a more natural way to get your minerals? So if I look at this, these calcium carbonate deposits, which are limestone essentially, and of course you can, for a long time, you know, limestone products were actually readily available and still are, uh, calcium carbonate. And it's uh, extremely nat natural. You can basically take it, pure, not even hardly purify it, dry it down, put it in capsules and take it. Um, or you can take that calcium carbonate or calcium oxide uh, as a starting material you can blend it with citric acid, so you can kind of create a new compound, and you could dry that down and make calcium citrate. And that also obviously is from nature, and in the general sense, the calcium is still coming from limestone or some natural source, but there's not a lot of calcium citrate in nature. But as it turns out, you know, looking at the data, uh, calcium citrate may, may absorb better, it may actually function better in some clinical trials. Uh, calcium carbonate and calcium oxide will often reduce uh, the acidity of the stomach, then reducing you know, other, other factors like protein absorption or B12 absorption or increase the, the likelihood of overgrowth of the bacteria and the small bowel. So there might be reasons we don't want to use calcium carbonate, but calcium citrate isn't necessarily a more natural form. And then finally, there are chelated forms. And these are obviously very popular uh, within the physician channel. A lot of companies are using various uh, glycinates or, or glycinates of calcium, magnesium, other things. It, I, the idea behind these is to mimic sort of how some of the, the minerals are found in plants because a lot of these are complex with amino acids. But, you know, obviously to make these products, they're not actually extracting them from plants. They're creating in a in a factory essentially using cal various calcium sources like calcium carbonate and then reacting them and modifying them uh, with various amino acids. And in most cases, it's glycine. And the reason glycine is typically chosen um, for most of these is because it's small. And so if you wanna deliver a amount of calcium at a, at a reasonable amount, you have to use a small amino acid because there's typically two amino acids attached or, or chelated to a, a single mineral. So which one of these is more natural? Um, you know, you could, we could argue the one on the left is the most natural, but which is the most appropriate supplemental ingredient? And I think this is where, um, you know, we, we don't often have as, as many head-to-head -head studies as we'd like to say, okay, if I use my uh, magnesium citrate and it absorbs better, but it's a lower percentage of magnesium than mag oxide, which absorbs very poorly, you know, where is the, the difference in cost between these two? and actually delivery of the mineral. Um, and so we, it would be, it would, we would really like to have more head-to-head -head studies uh, that actually ask this question. I think uh, clinicians often know that there are subtle differences between these, but it's not as easy to say one is natural and one is unnatural. Um, there's a lot more uh, data that's needed uh, to talk about the differences between these. So there's a lot of misunderstanding and confusion. So while there's some known differences between synthetic vitamins and their natural counterparts, most of this information is, I, I think is false or greatly exaggerated. Uh, for better or worse, almost everything that we know about how vitamins work today have come from the synthetic analogs. So for instance, um, when we discovered in foods the various components and we synthesized and proved that when we added those things back to animals or humans who were deficient in those nutrients, then we started studying that compound or that nutrient 
in its synthetic state in order to uh, understand how it functioned. So that's just a, that's just a history of vitamin research. Um, and then un unfortunately, comparing a natural versus a synthetic form, you'd think, okay, this is a big deal. Wouldn't people want to study this? The research on this is almost non-existent uh, because there's been the assumption that they they actually function very similarly. However, it's we know that that uh, not all these are bioequivalent. So for instance, synthetic beta carotene is a single isomer, while almost all food beta carotenes um, and those derived from let's say microalgae, which are all now common in supplements, uh, are actually multiple isomers. So we know that there are different iso isomeric compounds. Uh, and when you're using a pure synthetic form, you're only getting one of those isomers. And so you're likely getting a different sort of uh, beta carotene at that point. Uh, vitamin K, we know that vitamin K, K1, which is typically found um, either as a synthetic or in, in uh, green leafy vegetables. Vitamin K2, as most of you know, there's two forms, MK4 and MK7. And then K3, which is a synthetic, which is typically not used anymore, um, even as a drug. Um, and then there's natural folates versus synthetic folates and folic acid, which we will discuss here in a minute. And then there's various isomers in the vitamin E family. This just gives a little bit of a, a just a few examples where there's a difference between a synthetic and a non-synthetic or the natural form, some of which can be used in supplements and some of which are very difficult to mirror in supplements. So vitamin E, I think for a long time, people have discussed this notion that vitamin E uh, you know, some of the failures of the vitamin E research has been using synthetic forms. So what is the difference between a natural and a synthetic vitamin E? So first of all, let's, let's just be clear that only alpha tocopherol, so we, we know there's beta, beta gamma delta tocopherol, but only alpha tocopherol can be labeled as vitamin E. And there's sort of a historical reason for this. Um, actually, the way that vitamin E is transported in the body and the way that vitamin E deficiency is defined in both animals and humans seems to only be uh, able to be overcome using alpha tocopherol. So for instance, the, uh, the, the transporting uh, tocopherol transporter really only transports alpha tocopherol in, in a very unique way where it does not do that with beta gamma delta. So there's some history behind that. So if you're looking at a, a, at a label and they have mixed tocopherols in there, which includes, let's say, some of the tocopherols and maybe even some of the tocotrienols, which are double bonds in, in, the, in the aliphatic chain, um, you, uh, you only see vitamin E, the alpha tocopherol, in the top of the box where it gives a daily value for vitamin E, and then all of the other milligram amounts of, let's say, beta or gamma tocopherol or, or tocotrienols are below that line in milligrams. There's no daily value for them. So that's sort of in, important uh, to understand. Now, is it turns out that you know some of these other forms probably have some biological activity. Most people believe they do um, as antioxidants or, or whatnot, but we don't have the same sort of information or some same sort of data as a vitamin. So that's why you see the difference. So up here on the top, you can see sort of the difference between the to tocopherols on the top and the R groups that are on the ring structure, you can see based on whether there's methyl groups or hydrogen groups, that gives us the different alpha, beta, gamma, uh, delta type tocopherols and tocotrienols. So all of these come in nature. We have all, of, all eight of these uh, different um, forms in nature. However, when you synthesize um, vitamin E, you can see in the top here, and I, this might be getting too in the weeds for some of you, but uh, when you have a synthetic vitamin E, um, you have a blend of all racemic isomers. So for those of you who aren't into chemistry too much, each of these little arrows show a what's called a chiral carbon. And so the, each one of these can be in the cis or trans form. And it turns out that when the body makes this, it's, it's synthesized, when nature makes this in, in plants primarily, uh, you get all of these at the R position. So all of these are, there's only one, let's say one form of natural, and we call it RRR. Um, sometimes it's called uh, D-alpha tocopherol, but it's probably better to call it RRR. Um, and that's what you get. When you get synthetic vitamin E, 
you get an equal mixture of all eight of these positions. I won't go through all of them, but you can see them here, RR, SRR, SSR, et cetera. So you get different confirmations. And why is that important? Well, only, only those that are in the R position at the first chiral carbon will be treated in the body as vitamin E. So already half of the synthetic vitamin E is not really truly going to be treated as vitamin E in the body. So you have not, so right there you have that affecting it. And so there's some people that believe that not only does this create an adjustment for the vitamin E activity in these synthetic forms, but that these other isomers can actually act as inhibitors or interfere with the, for, the function of vitamin E in the body. And so again, there's not a lot of data to suggest that, but there certainly is a difference. We know that there's a compound difference between these two. And so as it, thankfully, the availability of natural vitamin E typically derived from soybean oil um, and sometimes from sunflower oil. Those are the two commercial places where we get uh, enough vitamin E that we can concentrate. Sometimes corn oil is also has been used in the past, but you have to use these concentrated oils from plants like that, uh, typically soy or sunflower, to get enough natural vitamin E. Um, otherwise, you, you, you'll see that a lot of these are um, synthetic. And so one of the things you'll see, the synthetic if you, is either called all racemic, which is probably the, the, the definition that should be used, or sometimes DL, which is kind of a, a, a misnomer, but that's still used uh, in the literature. So this is a classic example where there's a difference. How about vitamin C? Well, as it turns out, the difference between L-ascorbic acid that's synthesized, I show you here, the D-sorbitol, uh, converted, you can see the, the chemical synthesis from sorbitol to uh, ascorbic acid. This is typically uh, sorbose or sorbitol derived from corn. Um, that L-ascorbic acid is virtually impossible to, it's, it's, vir it's bioidentical from the natural form. And so the Linus Pauling Institute, which is probably maybe the leading source on vitamin C information in the world, has actually tried to decipher any sort of biological difference between vitamin C found in, let's say, oranges, versus vitamin C ascorbic acid, and they can find no chemical differences, nor any uh, biological differences. And so I always ask this question, you know, is then 60 milligrams of a synthetic ascorbic acid the same as 60 milligrams of vitamin C from oranges? And I, I, my answer typically is from the standpoint of vitamin C activity, the answer is probably yes. But from an overall nutrient standpoint, Point. No. Uh, the addition of flavonoids and other components that we know sort of interface with ascorbic acid, uh, you know, uh, redox reactivity in the body would suggest that, you know, getting this in, in combined with flavonoids or in nature may be the same. The issue is not if I want to deliver 60 milligrams of ascorbic acid or vitamin C, I could maybe get that from foods. But what if I want to give 600 milligrams or two grams of ascorbic acid? Well, now I'm talking about, you know, a, a garbage bag or garbage can full of oranges. And, you know, these are impossibilities. So when I start, when I want to start using vitamin C in doses that are virtually impossible to get in the diet, then I'm, I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm going to have to go to ascorbic acid. So um, that's, that's where we are with, with that kind of thing. So think about it this way. So a lot of people say, well, can't I just use whole foods? Well, I don't want to get too much in the weeds on this, but I can tell you I spent a lot of time in this area, and I can tell you that the products that are labeled as whole food vitamins are neither whole nor foods, meaning that in most cases, in fact, in nearly all cases, because of the FDA requirements that a product contain exactly what it says it has in it over the life of the expiration date of the product, uh, some of the products are, are synthetic vitamins with a blend of fruits and vegetables, and they, so they call these whole foods, which are not. Um, many of these are yeast extracts or bran extracts with actually very low vitamin content. I don't consider yeast extracts or bran extracts foods in the general sense, certainly not whole foods. Um, and then a lot of products are, quote, spiked with synthetics during some sort of pre-fermentation process, which I can tell you is really marketing jargon. Um, and really these products uh, are basically synthetic add-ons. Um, and there's kind of a, a legal loophole they use so that they don't have to label them. Uh, I'll put them on the label as, the, let's say, ascorbic acid or pyridoxine hydrochloride, et cetera. So most of these products, by combining concentrated food ingredients, contain either extremely low levels of any vitamin or mineral, most of which are unstable. So that's why whole food supplements, by their definition, 
typically don't don't fly. So the irony of food-based nutrients is that vitamin and mineral content in food are rarely uniform, making it very difficult to standardize, which is obviously one of the issues of labeling. Um, they're extremely unstable when food is processed to concentrate the nutrients. So even if I try to concentrate all of the, let's say, ascorbic acid from oranges, they really degrade very quickly. They're not in a state that they can be preserved. Um, and then, of course, like I said, the GMP requirements for manufacturing make these supplements really almost impossible. So what I tell people is, you know, in an ideal situation, all the necessary nutrients would be delivered by a nutrient-dense, unfortified, diverse diet. No supplements needed. So where is this ideal situation in the world? I, I think there's just very few of them. Um, and we could go through the soil issues, we can go through a number of things, but just the fact that digestion, absorption, um, and, and just the critical issues of what people are eating um, is, are, are there. Um, nutrient supplementation often requires concentrating isolated nutrients, combinations of these isolated nutrients, often at therapeutic doses. So our bodies are designed to absorb and store less common nutrients for for weeks, even months to ensure our survival. So no, no food contains everything we need in, in a perfect amount. So when we try to create a pill that's like the perfect vitamin that to mimic our diet, nothing mimics our diet. Because our diet, we, we, theoretically, if we're eating different foods, especially if we're eating seasonally, there's not an equal amount of, of nutrients in all the foods we eat. So the idea that we would need exactly the same amount of nutrients every single day, again, it's an artificial, environment, but unfortunately may be necessary in humans often who are eating poorly. So I tell people, eat the best diet you can, supplement necessary. And I think, especially when you're dealing with people who are in various stages of chronic illness, supplementation may be the only way to bring their, op to optimize or, ther or create a therapeutic uh, nutrient environment for them. So how about the idea that some of these uh, nutrients are activated? So it's very common to see people say, hey, you need to have pyridoxal 5-phosphate because that's the active form or riboflavin 5-phosphate or the methylfolate or methylcobalamin or ubiquinol because these are the active components as opposed to the inactive forms. And you know these other inactive forms don't work. Well, unfortunately, this is really bad science and bad you know, nutritional science. Um, but there are some differences. So we talked about folate. So what's the difference between a natural folate and let's say some of these synthetic folates? Well, a natural folate comes into our body from the plants as these large polyglutamate, these uh, glutamate added, these large gl gl glutamates added, we call them polyglutamates, and those large molecules do not absorb. So the body actually has to deglutamate or bring these down into a monoglutamate form um, that you can see at the very top, which is the picture of folic acid. Um, and it, need, it absorbs it as a monoglutamate, and then it goes through the process of, in this case, methylating it. And then when it actually gets to the cells, it re-glutamates it. So it adds more glutamates back to the molecule. So it, it has to like break it down, absorb it, take it to the cell, and then kind of rebuild it back again. That's very common with many, many nutrients. And so, um, you know, we've known that there, there are different people that can absorb uh, folic acid or folinic acid or 5-methylfolate. All of those compounds that I just mentioned that are in your supplements are all synthetic monoglutamate products, meaning 5-methylfolate, which is I'll talk about here in a minute, is very popular. It is basically a synthetic product derived from folic acid. So folic acid is used and, they, and it's made into 5-methylfolate. And because there's two stereoisomers, it it costs a lot of money to kind of create the isomer that we want. And so that's what we often will use. So there's obviously many of you are using 5-methylfolate in your supplements as well as folic acid. So why is this important? Well, I actually wrote a whole chapter in uh, Dave Rakel's Integrative Medicine textbook on MTHFR uh, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase gene and homocysteine and nutrient needs where I get into the details of the polymorphisms of methylating folate and are these individuals at needing the 5-methyl versus folic acid? So we know that both folic acid and 5-methylfolate absorb very well. They actually uh, absorb at one and a half to two and a half times greater than food folates because they are monoglutamates. So they don't have to go through this process of removing all uh, the glutamates. So that's why there's a difference between the dietary folate equivalents for folic acid and 5-methylfolate than than the, the equivalent amount of folates in the diet. Um, so obviously when folates are finally uh, transported to the cell, 
um, they're actually then uh, fully uh, glutamated again, and that's their active form. So the, the difference that we have is that if you take in folic acid, typically folic acid in the enterocyte has to be converted to 5-methylfolate before it's absorbed. And so we do know that there is a slight variation or slight difference between individuals that have the ability to methylate and the ability, let's say a slightly lower ability to methylate in their absorption of folic acid. As it turns out, as many of you know, um, high doses of folic acid, however, absorb passively and you have an increased amount of unmetabolized folic acid in the serum. And there's sort of a debate within the scientific community about whether that's actually harmful or not. And there's so, sort of a debate back and forth. So what I tell people is that in general, the 5 methyl form of folate raises folate status and reduces homocysteine, oftentimes greater or better than folic acid, especially in subjects that have the C677TT polymorphism. That would be a uh, homozygous uh, polymorphism. Um, I will tell you that that's not always true. Um, Head-to-head -head studies where they actually compare these two, even in these individuals, don't always show a statistical difference. And ironically, even sometimes folic acid is better. And of course, we don't know why in some cases. So I, I would say that these are subtle differences, not gargantuan differences. Um, however, high doses of folic acid have been associated in some studies, although not all, with this elevated unmetabolized folic acid of unknown clinical significance. So what I tell people is, okay, this, would, this wouldn't be a problem if 5-methylfolate wasn't about 200 times more expensive than folic acid. So, I mean, if they were the equal price, I would say, okay, always use 5-methylfolate, but this is not an insignificant thing when we started getting into higher doses. So I, I generally think that the benefit is mostly in homozygous individuals or perhaps people that have, uh, you know, are heterozygous in both uh, 677 and 1298 uh, on the MTHFR gene. Um, so if you have people with those genotypes, and especially if you're using high doses um, and you want to avoid the unmetabolized folic acid issue, you typically want to use the 5-methyl form. Um, and, but I still think that folic acid is not inappropriate to use when we're talking about under one milligram in subjects who don't typically have uh, the polymorphism in question. So um, a couple other things to consider, you know, you can blend these together. Oftentimes these are very appropriate for supplement, supplementation. Um, and ironically, there's a, there's a few studies now that show that 5-methylfolate can be used for, un, for pregnant women with neural tube defects. Although I can tell you that there's not a lot of uh, data that's comparing these two showing that 5-methylfolate is much better. I typically recommend that, in, especially in women who don't know their methyl uh, MTHFR status or have obviously have had any sort of neural tube defect issue in a previous child, even if they don't know their genetic status should be using 5-methylfolate. And then always remember, if you're dealing with homocysteine, which is obviously one of the uses for high-dose folate, N-acetylcysteine is really can be very important to remove homocysteine bound to proteins because uh, a lot of times the the homocysteine can't be removed when it's when it's bound to protein. So that's sort of another thing that people should be thinking about, not just raising folate, folate levels all the way to the roof. So how about B6? Let's just kind of transition here. So most people don't know that there's actually three forms, pyridoxine, pyridoxal, pyridoxamine, and, and they're phosphorylated forms. And all of these are bioequivalent because they can be transferred back and forth with one another. As it turns out, oral phosphorylated forms have to be dephosphorylated to be absorbed. And this has been known for many, many years. So pyridox, so if you take in pyridoxine 5-phosphate, which is used in supplements, it has to be dephosphorylated, dephosphorylated to pyridoxal in order to be absorbed. And then the body transitions between both the phosphated and unphosphated forms in depending on which tissue it's, it's going in and which transporter. The transporters usually want unphosphorylated forms. The cell then converts that to its active form. But P5P is about seven times more expensive than pyridoxine hydrochloride from which it's synthesized. So again, uh, there may be reasons to use one over the other. In this case, I would say um, there really isn't a reason to use one over the other. Same thing with riboflavin. Riboflavin is exactly the same issue. Phosphorylated forms have to be dephosphorylated um, so that they can be absorbed. And so this is known. In fact, there was this, this is a paper as old as me. So this has been known absorption met uh, metabolism and excretion of riboflavin 5 phosphate in man. This goes back to 1967, um, and this has been known for a long time. So this is not surprising. 
Um, unfortunately, people assume that because you're giving the active form that it's going to be better for the patient. Turns out it's just going to be probably a little more expensive way to get that nutrient, not really any more effective. Um, how about B12? Now, we know that methylcobalamin, there's cyanocobalamin, which is the one that's typically used. People think of that as a synthetic form. The only reason that, that cobalamin uh, turned out to be cyanocobalamin is the original isolation of cobalamin from yeast turned out to be filtered through uh, a filter that had charcoal. And charcoal has... Uh, turns out to have cyanide in it, and cyanide turned out to be a very great complexing agent, and it came out as cyanocobalamin. So all of these other forms, we have methylcobalamin, hydroxycobalamin, adenosylcobalamin, when we use them as supplements, are all originally derived as cyanocobalamin and then made into one of these forms. As it turns out, there's been uh, a lot of recent studies trying to decipher whether one form is better than the other when it comes to clinical usage. And of course, methylcobalamin and adenosylcobalamin are the active forms in the body. Um, so a lot of people say, well, methylcobalamin is better. Turns out it's not that much more expensive. So it's only about one and a half to three times more expensive. Although I can tell you recently because of some plant explosions in uh, the manufacturing of cyanocobalamin, um, the price of B12 has gone up and some of you may notice that. Um, but the question is, is it more favorable? Well, as it turns out, there was a great paper written by one of my colleagues, David Brady uh, and IMCJ that talked about actually the data. Actually, I had a white paper on this and he wrote this paper and got it published. And he basically reviews and, and summarizes what I've said in the past, that there's no data actually to suggest that there's any advantages or one over the other. And we wanna get in the weeds on this, but as it turns out, this paper actually looked at the reasons why and it's because in nature, uh, or I should say at the cellular level, the process which methylates B12 assumes that it's going to remove the precursor to the methyl and add a methyl group. So as it turns out, if you give methylcobalamin to a cell, it actually doesn't see it as methylcobalamin, it just sees it as a precursor to methylcobalamin. It still goes through the motions of removing the methyl group and adding the methyl group back because it, it doesn't know any better. That's the coordinated system. So right now it does not appear that any of these methyl or any of these cobalamin forms are actually uh, better than the others. Um, methylcobalamin is often used just because it's not much more expensive than cyanocobalamin, but we don't really have evidence that it, it metabolically any different. Interestingly, if you look at other forms of B12 that are not supplements, like sublingual B12 or swallowable B12, sublingual actually technically is not a legal dietary supplement, which must be swallowed. But if you take a large amount, let's say a milligram of B12 orally, it will raise B12 levels uh, as well as uh, injections, because you're basically going through a passive absorption at that point and sort of avoiding the whole intrinsic factor issue. So how about CoQ10? Uh, CoQ10 is another one of these. Well, I need it in the active form. I don't want to take ubiquinone, which is CoQ10. I should be taking ubiquinol, which is quote unquote the active or reduced form. Well, as it turns out, if most of you realize that you can't have any sort of reduced form without a back and forth between an oxidized form. In fact, the whole process of CoQ10 is in transferring back and forth between the two. So this is a study uh, in, from 2007, so quite a long time ago, where they showed that the, the cellular uptake of ubiquinone, CoQ10, is almost all converted into the reduced form in black there, which is ubiquinol. So if I consume you, CoQ, regular CoQ10, almost all of it's gonna convert to ubiquinol in the blood. So there's no, there's no data to suggest that one form uh, has one biological difference than the other. But again, this is a lot of marketing uh, on that particular product. There's some data on high dose ubiquinol that, that hasn't been uh, shown to be equally uh, effective on you in the classic CoQ10. So there might be reasons to take some of these higher doses of ubiquinol, but for the most part, we have no real strong evidence that, that they're gonna be radically different in the regular supplementation. So what I say for these activated forms, almost all vitamin vitamins function in the body by a constant conversion between active and inactive forms. And in, mo in many cases, active vitamins are converted to their inactive forms in order to be absorbed or transported. So the idea that we're gonna trick the body by giving them is it, it, just never been shown to be true. Um, and actually inactivating the vitamin actually is beneficial because 
the body only wants them activated at the target tissue. It doesn't want them just activated in the serum or just in, in any tissue. Um, and even in the case of methylated folate, which I do think has a merit over folic acid because of some of the things we mentioned, the amount of the stored body folate that needs to be continually remethylated at the cell can't just be overcome by methylfolate supplementation alone. So remember, all the, all the remethylation of folate occurs in all these tissues. You can't take enough oral methylfolate to sort of overcome the need for internal methylation. So let's just talk about a few more things here at the end. Uh, fish oil. Fish oil, I get a lot of questions about uh, fish oil. Unconcentrated fish body oil, what we call natural triglycerides, are usually about 30% EPA and DHA. And the, the ratio of those is really dependent on the, the fish and the, and the water temperature. But if we're going to concentrate those, most of you know that these fatty acids are cleaved from the glycerol backbone, concentrated into free fatty acids, and then stabilized either as ethyl esters or reesterified or reattached back to the glycerol backbone to give us this bioidentical triglyceride, but a higher level of EPA and DHA. So most of the products you're using are ethyl esters or, tri uh, or reesterified triglycerides. And you can see there's all these other sources. Most of the data that we have comes from, um, from these high levels of um, EPA and DHA. However, I, at the bottom, I'll just mention something that's coming down the pike is GMO plants that are actually being modified to produce EPA and DHA. Right now, these are being used to feed farm fish, but eventually, I'm sure people will want to be using EPA and DHA from GMO plants, creating a whole other controversy, obviously, when it comes down the pike. So here's some of the molecules, the triglyceride, and then the various ethyl ester forms. Um, and then the reesterified triglyceride would be sort of the repackaging that. Well, why does this matter? Well, as it turns out, ethyl esters really are not bioequivalent or bioidentical, and so they don't absorb as well as the reesterified triglyceride. So the, when you repackage it in the triglyceride form, here's just one study uh, done by Jorn Dyerberg showing that there's this difference, and it's the very first uh, bar in each of these graphs is the reesterified triglyceride, and you can see Ohms on the right-hand side is ethyl esters, and you can see they have a much lower bioavailability or absorption into the body. And other people have done looking at omega-3 index, showing that the reesterified triglyceride, even out six months, has increased uh, absorption and incorporation into tissues over the ethyl ester form. And, and this turns out to be important when you're talking about reducing triglycerides. Here's a study showing that the reesterified triglyceride had a much greater substantial drop in triglyceride levels than the ethyl ester form. So these are not insignificant sorts of things. Now, I will tell you that even when you use a triglyceride form or a reesterified triglyceride form, dose matters. So this is a study uh, done by uh, Flock and, and Harris, and who's done the omega quant kind of stuff and the, the omega-3 index. And you can see that not only does the dose go up or the, the change in omega-3 index go up as the higher the dose, but you can see individuals along the curve. So some people taking a high dose didn't get a substantial increase. Some people taking a low dose did get a substantial increase. So this is something that you want to measure. You don't just want to guess based on the dose that they're taking. So time doesn't permit us to talk about krill in detail, but I can tell you that krill oil, um, if it delivers the amount of EPA and DHA as fish, which it usually cannot because of the price and the low concentration. If it delivered as much, it would probably be have the same benefits. Um, but the problem with krill is it's almost always delivering one fifth or so of the amount of, of EPA and DHA as fish oil. And that's really its Achilles heel. So let's talk about bioavailability because this is a big deal when it comes to supplements. It's always important to remember bioavailability and absorption are not the same thing. You can get something into the body but it doesn't mean that it's available at the tissues at the level it needs to be. And that's because there's a lot of other processes that go in, and this is very true of botanicals, and I'll mention curcumin here in a minute. Oftentimes this can be true. If you get more in, it's more bioavailable, but oftentimes this can be misleading. So when I think of natural compounds, we need to start thinking differently. So when I think of chondroitin sulfate, um, it turns out that the smaller the molecule, the better it absorbs. So how it's hydrolyzed makes a big difference. And so that's important for, for that. Fish oil incorporates differently into membranes and efficacy outcomes. So we want to know about absorption of fish oil. Um, CoQ10, solubility is key. So the issue of taking a powdered form, which is very insoluble versus a sort of a liquid or a, a lipid-based 
product increases the solubility. Minerals, I talked about ionization, receptor saturation. If you take too much of any mineral, you basically will inhibit its absorption or inhibit the absorption of another mineral. So that's another thing to consider. But when it comes to botanicals, there's all kinds of factors, the microbiome interactions, the first pass metabolism interactions. And so this is something that I've spent quite a bit of time, especially on this question about curcumin, which you're probably very familiar with. So this is a great paper. Can improving bioavailability improve the bioactivity of curcumin? And I, I won't, I'll let you read this if you have the slide afterwards, but the answer is sort of, well, not really. Um, we've done all kinds of things to improve the bioavailability of uh, curcumin, but we have not really shown that it's increased its bioactivity. And that's primarily because on this particular slide, it shows that curcumin can go down a number of metabolic pathways. On the left-hand side, you can see glucuronides and sulfates. As it turns out, all of these fancy products that increase bioavailability actually convert most of that curcumin into inactive sulfate and glucuronide forms. And so we haven't been able to overcome this idea of getting free curcumin levels increased. And so most of the, in fact, I would say almost all of the improved bioavailability curcumin should really say improved absorption because they don't actually improve the bioactivity or bioavailability at the tissue of curcumin in almost every situation. And I believe that's partly because these compounds really probably are meant to, to be taken at low doses and maybe because they interact with the microbiome or have other relationships like epigenetic signaling in the body. This is a great paper that actually started down this question. Could the gut microbiota reconcile the oral bioavailability conundrum of traditional herbs? Meaning how many of these products uh, or ingredients have been shown to function at low doses affecting the gut microbiota. And sure enough, there's a whole series of papers published in the last several years on curcumin and its influence on the gut microbiota. Now, if I take my product and I put it in a liposome or I put it in some sort of other nanotechnology or whatever, and I get it into the body, but I don't, and I avoid that interaction with the gut microbiota, I may actually not only have improved the benefit, I may actually have decreased its benefit because now I've partly avoided its interface with maybe the target, which is the microbiota itself. So I know I covered a lot of things at a high level here. I mean, there's all kinds of other issues, um, even the difference between these capsules and tablets and powders and liquids, GMO issues, um, organic fruits and vegetables, refrigeration, probiotics are a whole other topic, excipients. So there's lots of things that we could talk about. Um, I, without promoting the book or whatever, I could say that all of these information is in the book that, I, that I'm coming out, Supplementing Dietary Nutrients. Um, so the clinician is the educator. The science of nutrition and the use of supplements is a, there's a lot of nuance. Clinicians and pharmacists need to be careful when advocating a position without fully understanding that. Marketers of dietary supplements will often exaggerate differences, differences between forms using limited or some, oftentimes speculative data. I tell people, hey, the newest form is not always better than the form that it's attempting to replace. It's just newer, and everybody likes newer, but it's often not better. Um, healthcare providers using supplements really should do their homework before advocating or teaching their patients or teaching other clinicians. So without, without the health of trusted, knowledgeable healthcare providers, most patients will try to figure it out on their own, and you know what the internet's like, how much confusion is out there. So I appreciate you allow uh, Genova giving me the chance to talk about these topics, which I'm very interested in, and hopefully uh, you'll understand just some of the nuances and the importance of really getting your information when it comes to sort of supplementing with the right nutrient. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Williams. That was just an awesome presentation, um, and we've received a lot of feedback already. So I just uh, first want to remind everyone that the the slides will be available. Uh, they're available now under the handouts window, as well as will be available on the website uh, within a week. And we did receive quite a few questions, so I was just going to start with, um, you know, we hear a lot about concerns around the particular source that a nutrient is derived from. You mentioned vitamin C coming from corn versus oranges, and I hear this more so with respect to somebody maybe having a food sensitivity around corn, and so they don't want to, you know, use that particular source. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so when it comes to, I mean, it, it, again, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, um, there's sort of a debate about whether there's truly allergens in corn particularly, but almost all allergens are, in, are from the proteins. 
So purified ascorbic acid would have virtually nothing left of the corn except for the L-sorbose that's converted to ascorbic acid. Um, this can become more complicated when it comes to other, other like for instance, flax or flaxseed oil or those kind of things. Uh, vitamin E, for instance, from soybean oil, it's highly purified. And actually the FDA does not require an allergen statement for like vitamin E derived from soy. Even though a lot of companies will tell you it's derived from soy, they don't technically have to label it as an allergen. So it's really on a case by case basis and the company has to decide whether it's likely that there will be an allergen um, or some sort of sensitivity. Now, when it comes to other things like, you know, corn that's GMO derived, that's a little more complicated because we don't always have enough um, GMO, non-GMO corn der derived ascorbic acid to satisfy the market. Got it. Um, another question that, that we hear a lot is with respect to supplementation, and I appreciate you going into kind of, you know, eat the healthiest diet as possible and then supplement when necessary. Um, but some of the, the questions we get around that concept too is just how hard is it really, even with a great diet, to get all the nutrients you need, whether it's soil depletion or other factors? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's, I think it's uh, difficult, but not impossible. Um, and it depends on other factors. Uh, for instance, if a person is young and healthy and, you know, is no chronic disease and, and these kinds of things, probably it's going to be much easier. Um, but the question is, are they going to be getting adequate of all their nutrients? You know, sometimes the use of multivitamins or specific uh, nutrient supplementation is there because, you, you know, you might do very well in some nutrients, you might not do well in all of them, particularly vitamin D. If somebody's getting plenty of sunlight as compared to somebody who's not getting a lot of sunlight, um, the soil depletion question is, is complicated uh, because there's really not a lot of good data out there. Uh, the question about, you know, organic versus non-organic and sort of industrialized farming that's only replacing sort of, you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium um, compared to other minerals in the soil. So we've actually looked into a lot of this uh, for our for our book. And, you know, the data is not as clean as we'd like to say is like soil depletion causes mineral, you know, mineral depletions. But we know like for instance, iodine in some soils has is, is been shown to create goiters if it's low or whatever. So we've got data, but it's just not across all of the minerals that we'd like. So to answer the question, um, I think some of you have to be extremely diligent um, to optimize their nutrient intake from food um, and not to create any depletions from their food, like you know, you know, poor eating habits that actually deplete nutrients. Gotcha. Um, another question about the different types of cobalamin to use in patients with gastric bypass surgery. Do you have an opinion on that, whether it's methyl versus cyanocobalamin, oral versus sublingual? Um, you can take from from an oral standpoint, you can take um, one milligram gastric bypass patients. You will have absorption uh, because it's mostly passive absorption. It's not at that dose. You're not using the classic, you know, intrinsic factor uh, binding. Um, so I think you're going to be fine, but I would want to follow them. You can follow B12 or MMA levels and then look at other ways. Uh, sublingual B12 or intranasal or intramuscular are alternatives if, if that doesn't work. But I think oral uh, B12 at one milligram is likely going to be fine in those individuals. And just one other question that I, I've heard a couple times is that uh, with respect to microbiome bacterial production of B12 and that reflecting higher uh, serum B12 levels coming from things like bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. Have you seen anything like that in the literature or heard of that? Yeah, so we've actually explored the idea of bacterial, you know, B12, vitamin K, you know, folate actually. Um, and so you have a number of, those are the basic ones, but there's a few others that are micronutrient derived or actually mi microorganism derived. Um, and we've attempted to find in the literature how those are known to affect the status of the individual and basically the answer is it's unknown. It's very difficult to to like radio label or figure out exactly the contribution. So at this point I would say there a lot of it because a lot of it's uh, fermented in the colon where we have less absorption of some of these although there are some there's some absorption. So uh, it's likely going to be used by the microbiota more than it is um, or maybe by the, the colonocytes directly rather than sort of the serum status of the individual. 
Great. So in the interest of time, we'll end our question and answer period there. For additional educational materials, we'd like to encourage you to go to our website, www.gdx.net. And on the site, you'll find sample reports, kit instructions, and other information for all of our Genova profiles. Um, after taking advantage of the materials found on our website, feel free to contact client services with any questions. Uh, I see a number on the slide here for US and UK customer support. And also call client services if you need assistance in setting up a MyGDX account. Finally, we'd like to encourage you to look for upcoming webinars on our website. Next month, we have our own Dr. Christine Stubbe presenting on understanding the clinical significance of the commensal bacteria. And just want to say thanks again, Dr. Williams, for an excellent presentation. Yeah, thank you for letting me come on. All right, take care.